indeed a wonderful, wonderful feeling based upon understanding of God's word that we're in the glory land way. We're in the present tense of overcoming all the time. He that is overcoming, we have the joys of heaven waiting to us. It's a present tense life that we live. And every day we're either overcoming or we're falling backwards. We're getting stronger or we're going to become weaker. We don't stand at a place where I am now arrived. As long as we have breath in our hearts, the devil has an opportunity to take that breath away. He has an opportunity to take us away from the Lord. And what we do each week, we remember why we're here, how we can be Christians. We remember the Lord's death. We sing songs of praise because we've been saved from, by God's grace. We're here to encourage one another in the teachings of God's word and the worship service that we have. It's to keep us stronger. It's to keep us strong against the wiles of the devil. In order to do that, we always go to God's word. And especially, is that important this evening? Because there was something that Jesus said to Peter on one occasion, that the devil would like to sift you like wheat. He'd like to do that with you, with, with, with you, Peter. We find in Luke, the 22nd chapter, in verse 32, but he says, I prayed for you. I said, well, that's great. God's already prayed for me if I'm Peter, and I don't have to worry about anything. Well, I, I prayed for you that your faith will not fail, but that when you have returned again or have turned again, something's going to happen. Satan wants to have his way with you like he can with you and me. But when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. Establish your brothers. And that's what I want to concentrate upon. First of all, we want to look at Peter and realize that Peter was one that had a lot of good qualities. It's been said that his virtues and faults came from a common root in his enthusiastic disposition. Enthusiastic disposition. That picture might not look that way to you, but deep down of enthusiasm for truth, Enthusiasm for the Lord. When everybody was turning away from Jesus in John the 6th chapter and verse 68, when the disciples were turning away because the sayings were a little difficult for them to understand, he said, will you also turn away? As he looks at the apostles. It is Peter. It is Peter who speaks up. Lord, to whom shall we go? You're the only one that has the words of life. Where are we going to go? It wasn't the other apostles that spoke up, it was Peter. And everybody's leaving, but not Peter. Enthusiasm, a disposition that says, Lord, we're here with you. Where else can we go? When Jesus was asking his apostles, who do men say that I am? Oh, some would say that thou art Elijah. Some would say you're John the Baptist, raised the dead. You're Elijah. You're one of the prophets, like maybe Jeremiah. Well, who do you say that I am? I'm not talking about other men. It is Peter that speaks up. He doesn't hesitate. Deep down, he knows in his heart, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, based upon that confession, I'm going to build my church. Peter had it right, didn't he? He was one that would speak up. He had a fervency for the Lord. He understood who he was. And he was always wanting to serve him. Lord, if it be you, it's about three in the morning. And it wasn't just a calm sea. It was choppy waves. It was difficult time. People were scared in that boat. And he said, Lord, if it be you, command me to come to you on the waters. And he would, he would sink and he would have his problems with that confidence, but the disposition was there. I'm ready to go. And that was a virtue. And it became a fault. Because when it came time 
for him to think about what Jesus has just stated to him? He said, Lord, I'm ready to go both to prison and to death. No, you're not, Peter. You're going to deny me three times. But I'm going to pray for you so that he, then you can establish your brethren. Notice the disposition, enthusiasm, Lord. I'm not only willing to go to prison, I'm willing to die for you. That's, that, that's worthy. That's a virtue. That's the way he was. But he failed, didn't he? He failed. And we've learned and heard about those lessons. He to think if he stand and take heed lest he fall. Don't brag on what you're going to do if you're not in the same situation at that moment. We learn lessons from Peter. But have you ever learned how to strengthen brethren? That's what Peter's going to have to do. Peter's not going to be destroyed. But he's going to have to strengthen his brethren. Oh, the devil's going to want to have his way with him. I'm going to sift you like wheat. I'm going to destroy you. Separate the, the, the shaft from the wheat. Now, I'm going to separate your faith from you. I'm going to destroy you. Because Jesus is talking about their faith. And I'm going to sift you like wheat. You're not going to be anything left. And Jesus said, that's what the devil liked to do. So he warns him, says, Simon, Simon. Whenever somebody says your name twice, they want your attention. Simon, Simon. Now we usually say the middle name of our children. Jerry Blake. Oh, I know that's something coming. But Simon, Simon, I've got a warning to give to you. I've been praying for you that your faith will not fail. What does he mean by that? It will fail, but not utterly fail. That's not going to be the end of you, sifted like wheat, destroyed, and sitting over there, separated from your faith, and you're just a bunch of chaff. That, a Peter that had a lot of fervency of spirit, but he's no good any longer. No. Your faith is not going to completely fail. Because you're going to turn again. Means, means he's going to be repenting. When we turn from where we are, we've, we have a godly sorrow. He would weep when he saw into Jesus' eyes what he had done in betraying him. But when you turn again, i got a job for you to do. Establish your brethren. Make fast their faith. Set their faith in concrete. Set their faith that indeed they will be strong. My question to you, and you've had time to think about it, how would you do that? What would you do to establish the brethren here at Parkview? How would you make them strong? Oh, we have so many tools at our disposal. We have so many books written. How would you go about establishing people strong in the faith? Well, we have a record of that taking place in our Bibles. We have 1st and 2nd Peter. Take a journey with me for just a moment and realize that what he emphasizes in these two epistles is the fact I'm going to establish the brethren, because they're going to be established in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit revealed Word of God. The Holy Spirit inspired Word of God. That's what they're going to be established in. And I'm going to hit it from all different angles. I'm saying that because that's what Peter does. He's anchored in establishing their faith in the Word of God that produces it. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, verses 10 through 13, he is establishing in the very first epistle that indeed this work of establishing people will be based upon the word of God. Because he speaks about the salvation that has come unto them, that gives them the confidence of hope in heaven. We pick up in verse 10 about the glories of Christ. It was prophesied. Holy Spirit was behind this. Concerning the salvation, the people sought and searched diligently who prophesied, or the prophets did, 
who prophesied the grace that should come unto them, searching for what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them. See, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit that's pointing people to Christ. They didn't understand it. Peter said, I'm going to take you back to the inspiration behind the Word of God. And the Spirit of Christ, who's going to be fulfilling Scripture, was in them. That's the Holy Spirit. But it's pointing to Christ. That's why it's the Spirit of Christ. And he says in verse 13, To whom it was, it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto you, did they minister these things, which has now been announced unto you through them that preach the gospel by the Holy Spirit. So here's inspired preachers now, but what the same Spirit, Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, now it's being preached, that have sent forth from heaven which things angels desire to look into. It is that interesting. Angels who have no part in the redemption of mankind about being redeemed from their sins. But we as mankind are. He said, I'm going to tell you this first chapter. I'm going to get busy establishing my brethren the faith. And they're going to be established in the fact that this word was in, is inspired of God. And prophecy is being set forth. These men who spoke didn't understand it. It's the spirit of Christ that's driving them. This is not a fable. This is not just man's word. He's strengthening them because what I'm teaching you is indeed God's word. That demands attention. 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25, it's this gospel that saved you. He hits it from this angle. When he says in verse 22, seeing you purified your souls and your obedience to the truth. There was an objective standard of truth out here. That's the gospel. Let's hit it from that angle. They need to be established. Need to put some dirt here. Need to put some soil there. We'll hit it from this angle. Peter, what are you doing? I'm establishing my brethren like Jesus told me to do. You purified your souls and your obedience to the truth. You need to love one another fervently. We pick up in verse 20 when he uses the Old Testament scripture that all flesh is as grass. The glory thereof is the flower of the grass. The grass within the flower falleth, falleth. But the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord abides forever. And this is the word of good tidings which was preached unto you. Paul, we've already heard that. I know. You're going to hear it again and again and again. Because I have a job to do. I'm here to establish you. You're going to need to grow. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, right after establishing the scriptures, he said, I want you to grow. You're going to put away the things that are sinful and long for the spiritual milk. Oh, you back to that word, aren't you? Yes, Peter. Yes, Peter. Peter said, yes, I am. And you long for the spiritual milk the sincere milk of the word, so you may grow thereby to salvation. Spiritual growth is necessary. He writes in the second epistle, he closes out the second epistle when he says, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because see, that's going to help you in chapter three, deal with error and deal with the things that are taking place that can take them away from their faith. How do you establish people and make them strong? You're establishing them in the word of God. If any man speak, 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And listen to the things that he sets forth there that indeed will help make them strong. You want to establish people? This is how you do it. When he says, for the end of all things is at hand, therefore be of sound mind. Be of sound mind and be fervent into prayer. Above all things, be fervent in your love. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God in verse 11. If you minister, minister by the strength that you have from the Holy Spirit. What's the purpose of all this? That God may be glorified. It's his strength that strengthens you. It's his word that you need to be speaking to people. And so, well, what's this in the context of? It's in the context of keeping you strong. Prayer. 
love, service, hearing God's word proclaimed. I don't think he's gone to a book of the month club. He hasn't gone to this magazine article. He's taken us to the very word of God that helps us involve and I need to be fervent in my prayer and be as we talked about this morning the church of our Lord is full of people that are ready to forgive. And he's doing his work. He has given us knowledge through the word of God. 1 Peter 1 3 through 4 or 2 Peter 1 3 through 4 and we have this because of the word seeing that by his divine power he could do a lot of things but through his divine power he's granted unto us things that pertain to life and godliness look at that person for a moment that pertains to life spiritual life you might want to be emphasizing that but life how do we live life in the flesh and live to be what godly I can't think of any stronger person than that they know what is it about life, spiritual life is emphasized, and godliness. I've got that through the knowledge. That's how God exerted his power so that indeed that message could give us that knowledge. But it's to all his own glory and virtue, whereby it's granted us precious and exceeding great promises that we could be saved from our sins. So what can happen? That through these ye may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption from the world by lust. Devil, take that. That's a right cross to your jaw. Because you'd like me to still stay corrupted in my lust. But I've seen the light. I've realized that indeed, here's the gospel light shining. I see that those are just ways of getting me to stay with the world. But I've got knowledge now. And I've got the word of God. And it helps protect me against your wiles and your deceptions. I've escaped the corruption. Why should I stay in corruption with you, devil? And Peter can sit on the side and do him a job. Those are strong people now. And all he's done is kept that word. He's hitting it from different angles, but he's given that word to them that indeed that's where our source is. And then he says in 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, in verse 10, see, they're going through sufferings. It's what children of people of God went through in the first century. When Christianity was first introduced, they suffer for it. And it's in that context we read this. If you've got your Bible, read it with me. And the God of all grace who called you into his eternal glory in Christ, after that you've suffered a little while, shall himself perfect, establish, and strengthen you. Here are all of the persecutions. Just use that because it's going to strengthen you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. It says, by Savanius, our faithful brother, as I count him, I have written unto you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand ye fast therein. What do you mean the grace of God? You're saved, aren't you? You're partaker of his divine nature. You're holy, separated from, from sin. You are growing in that sincere milk of the word that's not deceptive. All of that has come from God's grace. And it's been wanted to be looked at from the Old Testament pro uh, prophets who prophesied the, of, of Christ coming in all of his glory. That's not enough to keep you established. Peter's doing his job. So you stand fast in God's grace. Where did I hear God's grace? From the inspired word of God. Secondly, Peter does his job by reminding them of things they already know, but they need to keep on remembering. And this is seen especially in his second epistle. Second Peter 1 and verse 12, Wherefore I shall be ready always to put your remembrance of these things, though you know them and are established in the truth. 
which is with you, it's constantly with you. I'm going to make sure of that while I'm in the flesh. I'm going to make sure that it is constantly with you. And you're established in the truth, but that's not going to be enough. You need to be reminded. You need to be reminded. You need to be reminded of that truth. Because the devil can have you in a weak moment. That same context. You know what I'm here to do? Peter writes it. I think it right as long as I'm in this tabernacle and this body of flesh. To stir you up by putting you in remembrance. I'll stir you up by putting you in remembrance of things you already know. Does that stir you up or put you to sleep? It is sincere minds that get stirred up. Minds that really want the truth. And they will hear that. And I will stir you up by putting those things that you need to remember in mind. And I will do that. So that after I've died, you will remember those things in verse 15. As he says in verse 15. I've given diligence that every time you may be able after my decease, after I've departed. You call these things to remembrance. There was some important remembrance to be done of the glory of God, his word, their salvation, their hope of heaven, that they could allow them to overcome the things that are around them. He gave them warnings. The whole last chapter of his epistle to them is filled with warnings. At the end, he says, grow in the grace of our Lord, Savior Jesus Christ. That's going to equip you to be warned in advance of what is going to come this is now beloved the second epistle that i write unto you and in both of them i stir up your sincere mind by putting in remembrance that you should remember the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandments of the lord and savior jesus christ through your apostles knowing this first they're going to come mockers saying saying jesus isn't coming back again your hope of eternity is gone. Peter said, I'm going to deal with that. And they will happen. They will come. And he equips them of what the error is. He equips them what they're going to be saying. He shows the word of God what it states about it. He's equipping them. He's establishing them. He's reminding them. He's warning them. Of what is about to happen. Is it almost 3,000 people that were killed on 9-11? This coming September 11th will be a Sunday. It wasn't a weekend when this had happened. It's when people are going to work. The sky is blue. If you remember that day, it was blue over New York. You started hearing about a plane going in. I thought well, some farmer got loose somewhere. I don't know why I thought of a farmer. I just thought of somebody... Flying poison over a field and just got out of place. But no, it wasn't that. His people being destroyed. And that hasn't happened since. But it happened once. Wonder if they'd have been warned, it's coming. There's going to be an attempt to destroy our nation. And then we know that day there were other planes ready to do their destruction. They did it on the Pentagon. That ain't happened since. We have people in the audience, little children and young people that weren't even born then. Time is moving on. Can you see people mocking? You I mean, there was a flood back then. It hadn't been one since. Well, it's because God said, I won't destroy the earth by water anymore, but I will destroy it by fire. And they mock the coming of that. I tell you, before those New Yorkers and all of those people died, wouldn't they appreciate somebody, please warn us that this could happen? It changed lives, it changed our country forever. Being reminded and warnings that can come should cause us, because our minds are attuned 
to Christ and to God and to the spiritual things that he offers us. We should never think that is something that's not loving to warn us so much. And remind us and remind we are intelligent people. We don't need to hear the same thing over and over again. There's so much of the word of God that it should not be something that you think is constantly being thrown down for you to consider. But I tell you, he hit the word of God from all sorts of angles. And when he got through, he still the word of God. I want to stir you up. I want you to remember things after I'm dead. Here's a warning that's taking place. What is he doing? He's reminding them. And having our minds remember facts and remember truth helps us to remain strong. And thirdly, Peter had a unique place in order to establish the people. He was an eyewitness to the things of the glory of God. 2 Peter 1 and verse 16, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables, little stories that are just put together so well. It makes it so interesting. It makes it something that, that you think, this is possible. This is intriguing. I'm interested in this one. But it's just a fable. It's not reality. He said, we didn't follow that. When we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. We are eyewitnesses of his glory. What is that, Peter? For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there was born such a voice to him by the majestic glory. That's God the Father. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He said, that's what I witnessed. I witnessed that on the Mount of Transfiguration. I was there. I can tell you because I was one of the few that were there. And when he was transfigured into a glorious brightness, his deity is allowed to shine true in a glorious fashion. I was there. This is eyewitness testimonies talking to you. And he did use that. He did speak about that. This is not a fable. This is reality of what I had. And that becomes a powerful thing. Eyewitness testimony and fulfilled prophecy. That's a powerful thing in equipping us. Saving people's souls. Causing them to want to turn to this message that Peter is preaching. That he preached in Acts the second chapter. But in 2 Peter 1 and verse 16, he speaks about when we, we made known to you that indeed this is what Jesus had said, the Father said to him. Then we pick up in verse 19 through 21. And we have the word of prophecy made more sure. What the prophets of old talked about, you know what makes them more sure? It's because they've been fulfilled. Jesus has come in essence. You do well to take heed as unto a lamp shining in a dark place. He's that light of the world unto the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Because that's the only light you're going to get from God. That's going to be a benefit of salvation. Knowing this first that no prophecy of scripture is a private interpretation. Meaning it begins from my private thoughts. My, I might be making a fable. I might be writing a, a novel. A fictional story. No. No. I witness to this, this historical event. It's not a private interpretation that I'm bringing out the meaning of that. For no prophecy ever came by the will of man. That's what it means, private interpretation. It didn't come from my will. So I was inspired and I write a novel. Holy Spirit's guiding them. But men spake from God being moved by the Holy Spirit. There you are again, back to that word of God. Because that word of God has been confirmed. That word of God has been confirmed that it's seed from God. And there's no other message worth talking about that will establish us in the faith that we can resist the devil. And I just think it's interesting as we close this evening. 
Peter was told to establish his brethren. My question to you at this point in time, did he do that? Did he do it? We've looked at first and second Peter. Overview. Hitting at the particulars. And I'm saying three things he did in those epistles and established them. He established them in the spirit revealed word of God. He established them by reminding them. And said, I'm going to keep on reminding you of the things that you need to know to make you strong from the Word of God. And he established him with a combination of prophecy being fulfilled and his eyewitness testimony to something of the transfiguration. There are also witnesses of his resurrection. He talked about the transfiguration. Because that's something he personally was involved with. And what it did, it brought forth the glory of the, God, of, the, of the Lord, his majesty. Why would you want to serve anybody less? You're going to be strong in the Lord. Now I want to ask you something, brethren. What do we not see Peter doing? It's kind of hard. We didn't see it. When he spent all that time establishing the word of God. Did we see him wanting to appeal to the word of man? He told us that's what we grow in. Are we going to outgrow the Holy Spirit, brethren? Where we need to inject a new way of looking at things through man's wisdom? Quote this author, that author? Do we outgrow the Holy Spirit? Do we outminister the Holy Spirit? We just read. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Peter, what's the context that you're speaking in? I'm talking about ministering to one another. You preach the word of God, and that's where you learn something. And Peter's was revealing the oracles of God, and he was instructing them that they be strong in their mind, they be fervent in their prayers, that they use their strength to minister to others, they use hospitality without griping. Where did you get that ministry? Got it from the Word of God. And you can read it in 2022. And that will help you be established in your faith, in your service unto God. I'm not demeaning being widely read. But what's happening sometimes is that we're outgrowing the word of God and no longer is studying God's word that important to people. We want news ways of looking at things. And that leads us, what did he not do? He didn't. Apologize for reminding them of something. He didn't say, well, we need a new angle to that. Oh, he had different angles. Are you impressed with how many angles he took with the Word of God? If you don't read your Bible, you would never get that. Because that wouldn't mean much. But it means a lot to me. To see how the various facets of the Word of God were brought to their attention. It wasn't boring. It's not boring. It's not a preacher that preaches the same thing and hears the same thing. But Peter didn't remind them of the same thing. But what he did is that he didn't mind reminding them. Stirring them up to the things that they need to be reminded of. And when he's dead and gone, they would bring it now to their remembrance because he pounded upon them in a nice way. I've heard a man preach here. And ask him to preach on the Philippian jailer. And he said things in that sermon that he couldn't establish with truth, but he wanted, he said later, he said, I think everybody knew that story. I wanted to be different. To his credit, he's at least acknowledging it. You know what you do when you want to be different? You'll say something that's not 
in the text, you'll see something that's wrong. So why, why do something that could lead that? Because he said that the flipping jailer, the because he was asleep that day, he was in his sin. Really? I bet you never heard that before. Oh, I could see getting sermons from people and said, hey, I'm going to make some application here. Sermons need to be applied. I'm going to apply that he's over there. He's asleep. You know what that means, brethren? He's, he's asleep in his sin. You need to wake him up. That's a new angle, isn't it? But it's not the truth. He was physically asleep. But that's not good enough, is it? We've got to make it a little different. And we're here to praise the majesty of Jesus Christ or ourselves. Paul says, Peter says, I'm just going to remind you the truth. He's not there to say, well, he's different. And he established them with their, his eye witness testimony of what? Of Jesus' majesty. Of his glory. Here's what people would say. You know what? You sure would help these people. We'd like to have you in for a gospel meeting, Peter. And this whole event, you remember, we're talking about establishing brethren. We'd like to hear a sermon. Because I think with a new generation, this will help them. This will make you authentic, Peter. You talk about when you... Deny the Lord. That will make you authentic to a new generation. They will listen to your reminders. They will listen to your message about the word. Peter, why don't you talk to them? Because you can be a regular guy like the rest of us. And you'll be authentic in our minds. And we'll start listening to you. I think it would be wise for you, Peter, to come and offer a little authenticity and tell us, to establish us in our faith, tell me about your failures. Peter said nothing about that. How does that make you strong? Well, you're just like me. That's what we want to hear. Brethren, that won't make you strong. Peter is authentic. He is an eyewitness testimony not only to Jesus' resurrection as an apostle. But what he did talk about his personal life was not his failures. He knew humility. He speaks about humility. But he didn't drag all of his sins. I've been a fornicator. I've been an adulterer. I have had problems in my life. And people said, we need to have him for a gospel meeting. He's just like the rest of us. We'll listen to him. Listen to his failures. Every once in a while, our world just changes and changes and changes, but the Word of God doesn't. Brother, how you establish people is to help them get excited about the inspired Word of God. And you know how you do that? You read it. It won't help you when it's on the table. Schools are now wanting to take it off the shelf till we determine if it's fit for our children to read because there's violence in that. The battle is on. But do we ever take it and read it? And we're never going to get bored because we're reminded of the truth that we've heard and a long time ago. We need to be reminded if it's the truth of God's word. But God's word is what establishes us. It teaches us how and the direction we're to grow. It teaches us how to serve. What do you have to say, man? Well, I can help you in your finances, and we're going to have a lectureship on how to be stewards of your money. That's fine, but I tell you that God's word is full of how to use the money. Will that come into play? Well, I've got a different way of looking at things. I'm not interested. I'll read your book. But we're here to establish brethren. And maybe when we get through with the Word of God, and I get through reading your books, we'll see if you have anything to offer, to offer us. Elders need to be aware of that. Parents need to be aware of what their children are going to be hearing when they go off to college. They're gone, aren't they? 
They're not here. They're growing in their knowledge. What is going to excite them? And I hope they'll be in a place where that word of God, inspired word of God, is driven home to their minds and made clear and made exciting and realize this is what establishes you, reminds them of things that we've been teaching them, reminds them of things that will help them be strong in their faith and their service unto God, that they're excited about when they hear the word of God proclaimed, and they will just eat it up. Because that's what's being offered them. And the testimony of the apostles' doctrine just anchors them. Where Peter says, this is the true grace of God. Stand fast therein. And we'll never be ashamed. It's interesting, when I get through seeing what Peter did, I see a lot of things he didn't do. That men might think, this is the way we ought to go. And I hope that we'll stay firm with Peter and realize what he has set forth to us, it will establish us in our faith and we'll be the people that we need to be before, before God. This evening, hope you'll take the lesson of the love of truth and your love for your soul. Think about it in your own life. Next Sunday night, I'm going to preach how you get zeal. How do you involved in having zeal and excitement for the Word of God and how the Bible speaks about that. I'm going to talk about that next Sunday night, the Lord willing, and we'll, hit a, we'll look at another lesson from God's Word about what the local church ought to be like. In order to establish us in our faith as we strive to be the local church here that's pleasing to God. If you're not a Christian this evening, we don't want you to to leave this auditorium and leave this audience and still be a, not a Christian. That's the most important decision that you'll ever make because you're preparing for eternity. And Jesus is that only way. Peter just kept on showing the glory of Jesus Christ, that he is indeed the Son of God. And what, what was said on the Mount of Transfiguration that was different from this baptism Oh, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, but in transfiguration, hear ye him. And Jesus offers you salvation. Will you hear him? Will you simply obey the teachings of the gospel? By repenting of your sins, Peter had to repent. And when he turned again, he was able to establish brethren. We have to repent of our sins and be baptized for the remission of our sins. And then we can be walking in the ways of the Lord. Will you be willing to confess who Jesus is? Peter had no problem. Thou art Jesus Christ, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Will you confess that and live unto him as a servant and he's your Lord? It all comes from hearing the gospel, the inspired testimony. Why don't you purify your souls in your obedience to the truth? That's what Peter said to do. Why not do that and let us help you, not only assist you in becoming a Christian, but then to realize we're going to stay firm to this word to help you to be strong in your faith. So that you'll overcome sin, you'll overcome the devil, and that you'll have that home in heaven that's promised to you, that eternal life, that everlasting life, that eternal inheritance will never decay, will never fade away, will never become corrupt. That's what Jesus offers you. And this evening, it can be yours if you obey the gospel now as we stand and as we sing.